each week we print these children's bulletins for the kiddos and it has prompts and coloring ideas and creative thinking ideas. Once you've seen kids have them and you still want one, you can go look on the little table. You can color some. Uh, We've been in Pentecost through summer and fall. And sometimes these bulletins mention as they do today, it says, today is the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. The color of Pentecost is green. Just as green things grow, our faith also grows during Pentecost. And then there's another one because there's a reader and a pre-reader. The other one says, one symbol of Pentecost is a tree. Just like trees grow big and strong, our faith can grow big and strong too. Thank you. I like that. And I think it's true. Our lectionary is organized in these movements and times so that at the beginning of our year, we have anticipatory stories of Christ's birth and the world groaning in labor, waiting for the Savior, and that is Advent. And then there's the gift of Christmas. And then Epiphany is, wow, the Christmas light keeps shining light on our world. Epiphanic joy, a light shines on you, and you are enlightened in God. And then the purple season of Lent comes, calling us to confession and fasting and giving. And then Easter in white and gold. Easter again shines saying the love of God triumphs even over death. Pentecost in red celebrates the Holy Spirit saying the Spirit was at creation and the Spirit is creating new things today. And then there's this season of green, the season after Pentecost. In a lot of churchy uh, books or pamphlets, it's called ordinary time. And that's good because faith is also ordinary. It can't be on fire all the time, thank God. But we can also see it as this green time of our growth. A seed has been given and planted And as we're blessed, we're free to grow. Just as green things grow, our faith also grows during Pentecost. In case any of you walked in here thinking, the green thing I want to grow is the money in my pocket. Not today with Jesus. Our attention is drawn to our faith growing because it's clear today in the readings that money invites greed and all of our human hearts are tempted to lean towards it and latch on to it and cling to it. But the wisdom of the scripture says, this is not the green growth of Pentecost. It is not the way of the kingdom of God. I've learned from a lot of you that the very Lutheran interpretation of faith is that which clings to God alone. Martin Luther teaches this in the Catechism. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods. And Martin Luther famously said, whatever your heart clings to and whatever your heart confides in, that really is your God. And in our human life, in this existence, we are offered Many idols, we see and experience many gods, like walking down the street of Ephesus. To your right and your left are these temples to various gods and leaders who seemed like gods. What Jesus teaches in the parable today is there is one God to whom your heart should cling to, but these alternative ways will keep enticing you. They'll whisper at you gently sometimes, saying to our hearts, God's promise, huh? I don't know. 
It could be a lie. Don't trust that. Trust this. And so it's like we are asking our hearts, if you're like me, it's every day. We ask our hearts and our lives, is our creator trustworthy? Or will I give my ear to some other voice? From the very first commandment, the interpretation is, faith clings to the promise of God. Because those temptations are always there that we don't have enough or that we need something more and that we are invited to lean toward greed or that we might question what is. This has always been the human predicament and the human problem. Lucas, I love how you connected to it last week, talking about the question of money is a question of relationship to each other and to God. And you're in a tradition of scripture when you do that. Because some of our most famous stories tell us about our heart and how we lean. First, Adam and Eve. The question to those first humans is, did God really say? Do you remember that from Genesis 3? Did God really say? And the human heart starts to think, yeah, I don't know. Let me try to remember um, hmm, you bring up a good point. And the serpent goes further, telling the humans, guess what? God knows that there's more and uh, is not giving you the more. God's holding out on you and you deserve it. You're not getting what you deserve. You're not getting enough. The creator is hiding something from you. The creator can't be trusted. And they listen to that voice and they eat the forbidden fruit. Another key faith story. The people of God are freed from slavery in Egypt. This is their moment to be the people in the land God has given them. And so they're traveling through the wilderness. We talk about this story a lot in that purple season of Lent, traveling. And they need food as they travel. And do you know what God does? Gives them manna. Manna means, what is it? Uh, They probably should have said shalom or thank you, uh, but they're wondering, what is this thing? Uh, But they get it every morning. It's a gift that comes from heaven itself. But God tells them in this food gift, I'm giving you this manna every morning when you unzip your tent. They didn't have zippers, but when you... You tear away the flap and you go outside your tent, you get to collect this food that is just there. I don't mind that you're saying, what is it? Just go for it. But God says, I only want you to take enough for the day. Or if the Sabbath is coming, take enough for two days because you're not going to get it on the Sabbath. We're all going to rest. But only for a day should you take the food. That's all you need. There is enough You don't have to stockpile for days and weeks. I'm a giver, and I will give to you what you need for the day. Well, this is a miraculous gift. And the Israelites are still human. So what do you guess some of them did when they went out and saw the manna on the ground in the morning? You're right. They would still go and gather more than they needed. As if the Creator is keeping something from you. As if the Creator can't be trusted. And they got in big trouble with Moses. We're all tempted with greed and toward the love of money or something that would promise us security. We are all slow learners toward the faith that clings to the promise of God. In Jesus, and to the hearers of the story he tells today, the question is also whether or not the people will trust the word of a suffering servant. So Jesus is teaching, and they're starting to notice his way is not appearing that glorious. 
it's not appearing that kingly all the time. In fact, he keeps getting in trouble with the Pharisees for whom he's hanging out with. Why isn't he hanging out with the bigwigs? Why these prostitutes and poor people all the time? Should we trust the way of one who is suffering and who appears in himself poor in spirit? I've been talking to God about how I will tell stories about my traveling in Turkey. And I think there will be a lot of them. Um, but one comes to mind today, and it's not even the most important, but it's, it, it fits, I think. So Turkey right now is a Muslim country, but it has been through many different leaders and sometimes pagan, sometimes Christian, sometimes nothing, sometimes Muslim. So right now, um, you know, when you're in a country like that, the call to prayer comes from the minarets five times a day, and you hear it everywhere you are. Turkey is also pretty progressive. Not a lot of people are like responding to that noise, and that makes you think, what's going on? But you hear the prayer, and the holy sites to see are a lot of mosques. So I went into a lot of mosques, and it felt holy, and it felt prayerful and interesting but I couldn't read the script on the walls and um, I haven't read much of the Quran, so I didn't feel much of a connection, but I wanted to experience the culture. So I would go into these places and then every once in a while, um, there are not a lot of Christian churches, but for an ancient church that the Turks made a deal with the Greeks when they would have land, and they would say, like, after World War I, there were treaties that were signed that said, okay, the Greeks get to still have some Orthodox churches in the place, um, but they're only open certain hours, and you have to find them in their certain niche. And so my friend and I would go and find that one church. So we would get to go into a Christian church every now and then. And in the context of going into all these Muslim churches and then going into a Christian church, it did feel like a homecoming at a time. I would go in there and I suddenly felt like, oh, this is familiar. Oh, I see the icons and I know who that is. And it warms your heart. And if you know much about Roman Catholic Church or Greek Orthodox Church, a lot of the symbols of Jesus are still Jesus dying on the cross, right? Not a very Lutheran thing. We like to have an empty cross or our celebratory one here is Jesus resurrected. It's a resurrects fix instead of a crucifix. But you'd go into this Greek Orthodox church and it's the only church, Christian church I've seen in three days. And I would sit down to pray and there's Jesus on a crucifix dying on the cross. And my conversation with Jesus was kind of like, oh, there you are. God, I've been going into these churches and I believe your spirit is there and you've been with me at the sunrise and sunset. But here I see your servant Jesus and I feel the connection. There you are. In this country that is not lifting you up very much and is not letting people see you very much, it's a struggle to see you. I saw the crucifix and I thought, there you are. And as I sat under the crucifix, I also felt like, oh, Jesus, this is who you are. Quiet, hard to find. When I finally find you, you are dying and poor and you do not look victorious. And there's something about seeing a crucifix outside of countries that glorify Christianity there was something about the message of Jesus that resonated to me about being poor in spirit. When I finally found God's son, it was a poor in spirit, suffering Jesus. And so I sat there and I thought, what does it mean that this place is quiet and empty and my Savior is suffering on the cross? I found Christ barely visible 
but quietly preserving the way for me. That's my experience. I think that when Jesus is talking about money, people are also asking their hearts, should anyone trust the way of one who himself is suffering? Are they going to trust one who is poor in spirit when he talks about money? So hear the word today. I think our reading acknowledges that when you and I encounter the poor, we are to be moved to provide and share, and that we should actually do this while we have time, and we shouldn't wait, because Jesus' parable gives no leeway for being able to change your mind at the last minute and redeem yourself and say, I know I should have been doing it, now I'll do it. In utter truth, it actually doesn't give us a hint at redeeming ourselves at all. In the story, there's a man who gets to paradise, the poor man. It doesn't mention his fine character or his virtue or how he worked on himself in devotion. In Jesus' story, the poor man Lazarus is just given paradise. Like, blessed are the poor. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Given. So what do our hearts think of a message where we lay aside what entangles us and we trust God and we trust one who lifts up the poor. Well, one thing is in community, we gather around and encourage each other. We say to each other, be open. At communion, we'll say, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. And before we encourage each other that way. We'll sing a song of givenness. Let the vineyards be fruitful, Lord, and fill to the brim our cup of blessing. That's like us saying to each other and God, do your promise, God. You give good things. Fill up our cup. And it's at communion that we will enact what Jesus teaches today. Come forward with empty hands, saying, I let go of what the world invites me to cling to all the time. When I'm tempted to hoard or constricted, I go to communion empty-handed, and I get a gift from Jesus the Christ. Jesus says, here is the self-giving way of love for you. Today, take hold of the promise God gives Hear and trust God. What Jesus gives is true and abundant life. It is the blessing of green growth in Pentecost. Amen.